Lives Matter. Um, and we have a really, really excellent panel, hoping that um, all of them um, show, oh, Stephanie said that Professor Sen is logging on now. So um, yeah, we have a really, really good lineup. Um, and uh, just to let you all know, as I'm sure you saw in the sort of um, advertisement that this event is jointly hosted by the SOAS Festival of Ideas, the Decolonizing SOAS Working Group and the Centre for African Studies. My name is Maya Goodfellow and I am the research assistant for the Decolonizing SOAS Working Group and I'm just going to sort of be the chair slash, slash facilitator of the discussion today so I'd, I'm not going to take up too much time. Um, but as you'll, as you'll have read from the description, we decided to put on this event um, in light of the recent anti-Black violence at the hands of the American state and the protests that have taken place about this, but also about systemic anti-Black racism and racism globally. Um, and so as well as honoring the African descended Americans such as George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and many, many others that this movement sort of um, has coalesced around their killings, we also wanted to reflect upon what has happened here in the UK too, in terms of the loss of black and Asian life due to police brutality, state racism, and also immigration policy. So we're here to remember those such as Mark Duggan, Stephen Lawrence, Azel Rodney, Anthony Granger, Joy Gardner, Jimmy Mubenga, and many, many others whose names um, may, are not known, but should be. And this is really why we've decided to coordinate this um, discussion, discussion, which is um, titled Black Lives Matter, Britain is Not Innocent. And so what we're hopefully going to do over the next two hours is with our speakers and with all of you um, explore some of the themes around thinking around the Black Lives Matter protests. So looking at the history of the movement, but also thinking about the specificities of national or local movements. And but at the same time is thinking about how we might draw global connections. Um, and so, as I said, we have a really, really great lineup of speakers. I'm really excited to hear all of them, all of their contributions. And what I'm going to do to maybe sort of hopefully keep it um, clear. I'm going to introduce them in turn before they speak. So I'm not going to read all, all, all of the introductions now, but before they speak, I will introduce them um, so you know exactly who everyone is. Um, and each speaker is going to speak for around 10 minutes, though some speakers have slightly longer, um, and that to give us their thoughts on the, the subject, um, the sort of broad subject at hand, and then we're going to open it up for Q&A, and so I'll moderate that and let you guys know how we're going to do that when we get to it. Um, but first, to give some initial reflections is Stephanie Gurand, who is, I have to say, I just wanted to say, has done the lion's share of the work in organising this event, so this wouldn't really be happening without all of the work that Stephanie has done put into organising this, so I wanted to recognise that. Um, but. Stephanie is also a doctoral researcher at Goldsmiths um, University of London in sociology and her research examines gender and racial exclusion from access to rental housing in the United States. Stephanie is also the co-founder of BLM Cambridge. So I'm going to hand over to Stephanie now to just give some initial thoughts and reflections. All right, thank you very much. Um, I don't like the spotlight, so I have some slides if that's okay. <laughs> share my screen. Can you all see my screen? Yeah. Okay, very good, thank you. All right, um, so my name is Stephanie, as uh, Maya has introduced. I um, am a doctoral researcher, but I'm also a former Black Lives Matter activist. Um, on February 26, 2012, George Zimmerman shot and killed Trayvon Martin. Um, the following year, when he was acquitted, um, Patrice Colors, in addition uh, to Alicia Garza and Opal Zanetti, founded Black Lives Matter. They, in a post that went viral, Patrice Colors ranted about systemic violence, anti-Black violence at the hands of the state. And in the end, she proclaimed that Black Lives Matter. Um, and part of what she meant by that wasn't specific, wasn't just that Black Lives should matter or Black Lives Matter too, but rather that Black lives are people, are souls inside 
of a body and that bodies matter. And I think that's crucial to the framing of how we, we talk about anti-Blackness going forward. Um, in tw July 2014, Eric Gardner was murdered in New York City by, the, by a policeman by a now banned chokehold. And this is a problem that's going to keep coming up. Uh, the different methods that the state uses to murder black bodies. Um, in response to the murder of Eric Garner, a, a protest broke out and people were chanting, I can't breathe, because he was choked to death. And his last words were, I can't breathe. Later that summer, August 2014, unarmed teenager Michael Brown was killed by police officer Darren Wilson in Ferguson, Missouri. Um, and he was not charged due to a lack of evidence. Um, so a lack of evidence in addition to the vilification of, of Michael Brown himself, they, there was a, a smear campaign that he was not a perfect victim. And so the fact that he had a history of, of being not a great student, of not being, you know, the upstanding perfect person um, in, in society meant that this, the state could use that to, to justify uh, the, his murder. Um, as a result of that, in response to the dis <laughs> disgusting murder at the hand of the state, Patrice Cullors uh, organized Freedom Rides. So Freedom Rides was a concept that was taken up by Omar Moses, which is actually um, Dr. Omar Moses, who was a, a city uh, a civil rights activist in the 1950s and 60s, who also lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where I grew up. Um, and they had organized freedom rides down to taking buses down to the south to integrate the bus systems. Um, and Patrice Colors revived that process and called for activists around the country to come to Ferguson and to work with organize, um, organizers and for, for collective teachings. And that became a strategy going forward that everyone was on the same page that we would all be working towards um, the, dismantling the police system in the United States. Um, as a result of the teachings, over 600 activists from around the country came uh, answered the call and went to the teachings in Ferguson. And when they returned to the, the cities that they came from, they formed local Black Lives Matter chapters. So there are chapters all around the country. At, at the founding of the chapters, there were about 26. Um, and Boston was one, um, led by a good friend of mine, Terry Marshall. Um, right. So in November 2014, Tamir Rice, a 12-year-old Black boy, was shot and killed by a Cleveland police officer. And as a result of that, there was nationwide protests that went viral because there were now 30 chapters throughout the country that were organized collecting, that were organizing collectively um, to bring attention to this problem. Uh, specifically emphasizing his age and the fact that he was unarmed. Um, and then in December 2014, the grand jury did not indict the officers that murdered Eric Garner, and that sparked outrage and protest. Um, and that was the beginning of a local chapter. So Cambridge is a smaller city outside of Boston, and we decided that we needed a, a different strategy to smaller cities and suburbs. Um, and so we began to uh, organize a Black Lives Matter Cambridge, of which I was the founder. Um, in 2015, Baltimore police officers arrested 25-year-old Freddie Gray, and during his arrest, magically, he sustained several life uh, fatal injuries, and he died a week later. Um, six officers were involved in that homicide, and all were charged at first, but over time, all of the charges were either dropped or the ones who were charged were acquitted at trial. In June 2015, white supremacist Dylan Roof murdered 
nine African Americans during a Bible study at Mother Emanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston, South Carolina. It's, Af it's actually uh, the oldest black church in the United States and had been a crucial uh, location in the civil rights movement and it's part of the reason why it was targeted. Um, it, disgustingly, <laughs> Dylan Roof actually prayed with them before he murdered them in cold blood. Um, as a direct result of, of this brutal massacre of Black lives, um, BLM chapters across the country organized protests and vigils in honor of the lives lost and the humanity they showed. Also in 2015, um, say, the Say Her Name movement sprung up. Um, Black feminist legal scholar Kim Lee Crenshaw, who also um, is a critical race theorist and also coined the term intersectionality, began leading the charge for a Say Her Name movement. And she contested that although that Black Lives Matter movement was led by Black women. Yeah. Oh, God, Ravi, come here and read it if you don't believe me. Sorry, I just need to unmute myself. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Can I interrupt you? Sorry to just interrupt you very um, quickly to say people can't see your screen properly. Can you put it on full screen mode so that everyone can see it? Yes. Thank you. All right. There's a couple of um, things on the side that I need to see, but I have a, I have notes. Okay. Can, can you all see better now? Yeah. I'll just take that as a yes. Um, so, Black feminist legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw began leading the charge for the Save Her Name movement, and then in July 2015, Sandra Bland, a Black woman, was murdered in Texas. Uh, and she became the face of the Say Her Name movement at the center of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and then in October 2015, BLM chapters began protesting um, to, to highlight Black women, the murders and the police violence that Black women face. And um, there was an emphasis on uh, Black trans women in particular. Um, so by the end of 2015, 21 transgender women had been killed in the U.S which is a number that's disproportionate to their percentage of the population. Okay. Um, so in 2016, Black Lives Matter demonstrated against a number of police involved um, murders in the US, including Alton Starling, Corinne Gaines, Deborah Danner. I'm sure we can name many more. Um, but at the same time, there was a growing movement among um, among black leaders and black athletes and celebrities to join the movement to call for a change in the police system. So uh, basketball players, including LeBron James and Carmelo Anthony, um, publicly stated that enough is enough and began wearing t-shirts um, at basketball games and hosting their own events to discuss uh, police brutality. Um, notably, Colin Kaepernick, formerly of the San Francisco 49ers, kneeled before a game during the national anthem and um, wasn't offered <laughs> another position there, but he became an icon for the involvement of um, ath black athletes in this movement, which is something that continues to this day. Um, in 2017, it, uh, Black Lives Matter protests of police brutality continued but they also took up other issues, including housing discrimination, in addition to the policing and healthcare inequities, um, notably the um, discussions around uh, bl black women's maternal um, deaths in the US, the rate is disproportionate to um, all women um, during pregnancies in the US. Um, yes. And later that year, in June, Philando Castile was killed. Um, by the police, and his murderer was not found guilty again, and more protests um, ensued. Later that year, in August, um, a, a white supremacist rally called Unite the Right, which took place in Charlottesville, Virginia, uh, led to a white supremacist murdering uh, with his vehicle, a white ally called Heather Heyer. And this begins a really important conversation about um, 
about whiteness in the US and the role of terrorism in white supremacist groups in the US. Um, I'm sure uh, Alana will speak to this later. Um, in 2018, 2019, obviously there are more deaths, but interestingly, a study found in 2018 that Black Lives Matter, the hashtag was used more than 30 million times since 2013. Um, so, but in addition to, um, to the police brutality and the housing inequities, um, there, were, there were solidarity movements taking place because the Trump administration was um, actively engaging the use of police violence at the border, uh, of the Mexican-US border. Um, and ICE detained a, a, black act, um, a black rapper. And then Black Lives Matter merged with other movements in the US to, um, in support of dismantling ICE, which is another policing body in the US. And then we get to here, 2020, um, just before the lockdowns, the COVID-19 lockdowns began, Ahmaud Arbery was murdered by three white men, one of which was a former police officer. Um, also in March, 2020, Breonna Taylor was murdered um, during a no-knock search warrant for, for drug suspicion, although she was not the the principal person in named in the warrant. She was not suspected of any crime. Um, in May 2020, and this is also very crucial, um, Christian Cooper of Black Bird Watcher um, in Central Park filmed a white woman, uh, Amy Cooper, who called the police and lied on camera saying that she was threatening his life when he obviously wasn't. And this is a, a very important to what's happening in the movement because this, is, this goes to the heart of believing black people when they say that the violence is taking place. So this begins a movement um, of recording. Oh, this, had, this highlighted a movement that had begun over the past couple of years, recording people who were lying when they called the police because they know that black people fear for their lives when people call the police. Um, and then in May, George Floyd was murdered on camera um, using a, a technique that is now being discussed all around the country to be banned. Uh, but the banning of one technique doesn't, doesn't lead to the dismantling of systems that murder people. And so there's also a simultaneous movement to, um, to dismantle and to defund the police and to put instead um, to put instead systems that are community safety focused, that they're people focused rather than policing focused. Um, I'm actually currently in the US right now, although I live in the UK, um, I'm currently in the US right now working on campaign to dismantle the police department in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, so discussions about defunding the police, it's, it's taking place all around the country. Um, there have been movements all around the world to, to highlight the police violence that's taking place in the United States. Um, notably, there is a town in rural Oregon that actually, they didn't dismantle their police, but they didn't make, they removed them as the first responders and they sent mental health professionals and social workers in uh, unarmed people, vehicles to, to, um, to police calls, to 911 calls. And this is a system that's been working for decades for them. Um, yeah, I mean, I'll stop there. I welcome any questions specifically around uh, the work that I'm doing um, to dismantle the police. Um, discussions about the Karen movement, which is really fascinating to me because my research does center gender and race. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you so much for that, Stephanie. Um, yeah, that was a really great, um, I think, sort of timeline um, of, of exactly everything that has happened um, and like a really good way to start this. Um, and I just, just to know that your slides sort of stop moving um, at a particular point. So I, I want something that has been raised in the chat is maybe we can share those slides with the, with the list of people who signed up when we share the recording too. So for anyone who didn't see, or I mean, when, we, when the slides stop moving, um, those, if Stephanie's okay with it, we'll talk about sharing those um, after the event. 
Um, and if anyone has, I should have said it at the start, if anyone has any specific questions for a speaker that's all come to mind as they're speaking and you don't want to forget it, you can also put it in the chat or put it in a private message to me. Um, or you can wait till we get to the Q&A and sort of say it yourself. But don't feel like you have to speak or have to um, be on camera if you don't want to be. You can also send them as a, as a message and a note and we'll try and get through as much of them as possible. And if you want to send it directly to me, that's also fine too. I will make a note of those as we go. Um, okay, so our next speaker um, is Professor Osman Sen, who is uh, currently an Associate Professor of American Literature in the Department of, Engli of English at the University of, of Sheikh Anta Diop, Dakar, and who is also the Director of the West African Research Centre in Dakar, Senegal. Um, and yeah, so over to you, Professor Sen, thank you so much for joining us. Um, you've got around 10 to 15 minutes um, for your contributions. Unless Professor Sen isn't with us, Stephanie, do you know? Uh, we if if not, we can. Um, oh, Stephanie, you're muted, so I can't hear you. Um, but uh, if, if perhaps Professor Sen isn't with us at this particular moment. Um, Sorry. Yes, Professor Sen is here. Ah, okay. Uh, I changed his name to Professor Sen so he could be easier to find. Which means. Hello? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. This is Bato. Actually, Stephanie, we thought it was at 3 p.m. Oh, I, I put the time zone. <laughs> Hello? Yes, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, it's 3 p.m. GMT, so the time zone. Is he not ready to present? Two here. We can we can wait. It's fine. We can we can change the order if it's better. So we can make it uh, yeah. in half an hour. That's better. We have other speakers, so we can just shift the order if that works. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Great. So in half an hour. Great. Thank you. Um. Okay. Great. So sorry to um. I think Debbie isn't here. Debbie Irving isn't here as far as I can see. So sorry to put you on the spot now, Alana, but our next speaker is going to be Dr. Alana Lentin, who is the um, Associate Professor in Cultural and Social Analysis at Western Sydney University. She is a European and West Asian Jewish woman who is a settler on the Gadigal land. She works on the critical theorization of race, racism and anti-racism. So over to you, Alana. Well, thank you so much, Maya and Stephanie, and hello to everybody from Gadigal country, unceded sovereign territory of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, um, otherwise known as Sydney, Australia. Uh, it is past midnight here, and so I decided to write my text, so I hope you'll forgive me for that because I wanted to get it all down. But also the other thing I wanted to say is that, you know, um, I'm somebody who's worked, as Maya said, on, on sort of race, um, sociology of race, uh, and, and, and a lot on anti-racism. So I have a particular interest in anti-racism movements, and obviously I'm extremely interested in, um, and have been following uh, since its inception, the Black Lives Matter movement. I'm particularly interested in its global dimension. Uh, we know that here in Australia, there's been also Black Lives Matter protests, that were sort of instigated by um, the murder of George Floyd, but have very quickly um, been associated with um, the, the leadership of um, Aboriginal people, particularly to point out the disproportionate level of deaths in custody of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, which is just um, above and beyond out of all proportion. Just a few days ago, another man died in custody. Um, and this is an ongoing, um, an ongoing tragedy and an ongoing state crime. However, um, what I thought it would be better to do uh, was to speak to very briefly what I think is the context for all of this, which is um, what race is. And I've just published a book called, I'll hold it up, Why Race Still Matters. And I thought I'd briefly say in 10 minutes, if I can, um, why I think race still matters. So I'm not speaking directly 
about Black Lives Matter and anti-blackness, because I think there are other people on the panel who are much more equipped to do so. Uh, but I am speaking about why I think we still need to speak about race. And I checked in with Stephanie and she told me that was fine. So, <laughs> so if it's not fine, I'm going to blame it on you. All right. So, okay. So the dominant approach to race after the Holocaust, particularly in Europe, has been to treat it as a taboo topic. Now, personally, I don't think that is a useful approach. And I think the failure to systemically study the ways in which race has been such a key ordering principle of the modern era is largely to blame for the fact that racism and anti-blackness are still so prevalent. The Black Lives Matter movement, the indigenous, indigenous sovereignty movement, the migrant and refugee rights movements, and the movements against Islamophobia and all forms of state racism, as well as all of their predecessors, have pushed endlessly not only for a recognition of the insidious, violent, and often murderous effects of race, but also for education about race and racism. However, this has been met with pushback every step of the way. And despite the recent uptick in interest from liberals and progressives in anti-racism reading lists and the like, in the wake of the murder of George Floyd, Ahmad Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and Tony McDade, to name but a few in the US, there is an assault from governments in the West on the kind of education necessary for giving us the tools to start understanding how to overturn a system that has been fundamental to the world for over 500 years. So we have a crisis of racial literacy, but I want to be clear about what this means. When we think about literacy, we often think of it as a kind of passive ignorance. How can we know what we haven't been taught? But this is in fact a constructed illiteracy, similar to what the philosopher of race Charles Mills calls white ignorance, a structured and willful ignorance that is necessary to allow for the persistence of racialized injustices on a mass scale. One of the key things that is not known generally about race, fundamental to this racial illiteracy, is that it is a whole lot more than the idea of biological racial difference. Race is a key technique of governance that while it began within Europe, as Cedric Robinson shows in Black Marxism, came into full force as fundamental to the spread of European power across the globe and within colonial regimes. Racial rule constructs the divide between Europeanness and non-Europeanness, as Barna Hesse says, which is also expressed in the idea of an irreconcilable divide between white and non-white people. Ultimately, I define race as a technology for the management of human difference, the main goal of which is the production, reproduction, and maintenance of white supremacy on both a local and a planetary scale. So race, above all, is a project of rule. While race may create identities or the idea that there is an equivalence between the ways in which we are racialized and our identities, it is not identity. Races do not pre-exist in nature, but neither as many think does the ideology of racism create the idea of races. Rather, race is constructed over time and theorized as scientific in order to legitimize the domination of Europeans over non-Europeans, and to give the illegitimacy of white supremacy the veneer of rationality. For Stuart Hall, race inscribes power on the body, but it has no real biological or physical purchase. There are no such thing as races in the way we think about them genetically. Neither is race an invention of racial scientists. It pre-existed, in fact, the 19th century fascination with the idea of inherent racialized differences that were imagined to exist within what Hall called the genetic code. So it is crucial to understand that race has always relied on a variety of discourses of legitimation in order to rule. These include the religious, the biological, the cultural, the legal, as well as the purely genetic. So thinking analytically with race does not mean accepting the idea that there are fundamental differences between human bodies that map onto groups that we call races. Race is produced in the aim of inclusion and exclusion, but the boundaries around it shift and slide, as Hall said. The crucial thing about race, as Patrick Wolfe wrote, is that it is inherently an unstable concept. 
but it is its instability that lends itself to success as much as it does to failure. Because race is on such shaky ground as an idea and a mode of governance, it constantly has to be remade and reproduced. This makes it difficult to pin down, but it also provides the key to its undoing. So as I hope I am showing, although very schematically, obviously in the time, race has a complex and varied history. It is constantly being remade, it shape shifts and adapts to new contexts. This is what makes it incumbent upon us to submit race to rigorous analysis. We need to build racial literacy to have any chances of defeating the injustices done in the name of race. While I understand why we might wish to think without race, I don't think that it is possible to undo something without talking about that thing that we wish to undo. While it may have been progressive in the past in a more celebratory mood of multicultural optimism to talk about getting beyond race and achieving a post-racial nirvana, today, the refusal to talk about race is a right-wing demand. Of course, the paradox is that the same right that wishes to shut down talk of race talks about race nonstop. When figures on the right and the center talk about things such as the left behind and the white working class, for example, they are talking about race without ostensibly talking about it. They constantly elevate the concerns of a supposedly more deserving indigenous population over black, brown, Muslim, Jewish, and Roma people, but that doesn't stop them from pointing the finger at us for making it about race. What those of us committed to a race critical scholarship and activism need to do is to point out the precise ways in which it is the forces of racial rule, Western states, their institutions, and our allies in the media and academia, who in fact make it about race and have been making it about race since its invention. Talking about the ways in which race continues to structure and inform social life for us all, whether we are on the side of benefiting from current racial arrangements or on the side of losing out from them, it is necessary to force the contradictions of liberal democracy to its limits. It is at our peril, I think, that we give in to the forces of racial rule and white supremacy by accepting race on its own terms as identity and fighting among ourselves about whose struggle is purer or more representative. I want to believe that we are at a juncture when more and more of those who benefit from racial arrangements as they stand are willing to see that their freedom is predicated, to paraphrase the Combahee River Collective, on the freedom of everyone. But we have also been at what seemed like crucial moments before, so it is up to us not to relinquish the struggle, not to be naive about the challenges that we face, and not to reproduce the logics of white supremacy in our ranks. Racial literacy cannot be taught at a $30,000 a pop training course or from a best-selling book of bullet points. It is a process of lifelong unlearning. It requires the relinquishing of power and the remaking of the world in utopic ways. This process, as Stuart Hall wrote, is without guarantees. But it is worth it if one day, most probably unfortunately not in our lifetimes, people will be able to say, that race no longer matters. Thanks. Thank you so much for that, Alana. I think that was a really, uh, really, really helpful um, sort of way of conceiving of what race is and what it is that we're talking about. And I really also like how you situated it sort of in contemporary political discourse in terms of this sort of not talking about race, but actually talking about race, particularly when we're thinking about the right in the center, which unfortunately, is incredibly relevant right now, given the, the sort of the culture wars that are being enacted or trying to be enacted here in the UK at least. Um, that's great. Um, I think we now have uh, Professor Sen, are you okay to go next? Is that? Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. There was a mix up in the Sorry. timing. Yeah. yeah, but that's all right. But I'm ready. I'm ready. That's great. Um, I'll just do your intro again, just very, very quickly. So for those of you who maybe missed it or didn't yeah. hear it, Professor Sen. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Professor Sen is um, currently an associate professor of American literature in the Department of English, the University of Sheikh Anta Diop, Dakar, and also the director of the West African Research Center in Dakar, Senegal. And it is a pleasure to have you with us here today. So over to you, Professor Sen. Thank you very much. And again, I'm sorry for the mix up in the timing. 
Uh, but uh, look, I, I, I have a very short uh, introduction to the topic which was given me. Uh, uh, I, I am given 10 to 15 minutes presentation on the history of black movements in the United States. And as I was thinking about it, I came today, I came up with three words which are absolutely meaningful and seminal in the history of the African American people. Those words are mutinies, riots, boycotts, and protests. And as you try to think about those words, mutiny is uh, pregnant with certainly violent action or reactions. Riots already uh, shows you the uncontrolled dimension of the movement of the action. Boycott and protest are uh, possibly being considered as movements which, which have a peaceful dimension. And this is what I think is characteristic of the evolution of African-American uh, community uh, You know, movement or the fact of resisting whatever is plaguing your life actually started right at the beginning when the Africans were forcefully being shipped to the United States and they would resist their deportation. If you remember, there are two key words here. The word middle passage, you have in this instance from 1699 to 1845, 55 cases of mutiny, that is being in the ships, and revolting, resisting this forced transportation to the United States. And if you say mutiny, it cannot be the action of one individual. It's got to be collective action. The second one in relation to mutinies is the Amistad episode, whereby in 1839, 53 slaves mutinied and ordered their owners to sell them back to Africa because slavery was over then and they resisted. They allied with American abolitionists and won their freedom after a long legal battle. This is organized movement by people who were taken into slavery at a time when slavery was abolished. They were landed on American US soil and they engaged in legal battle and ultimately one the whole thing. You see the development of solidarity, the development of collective action among the enslaved people. That uh, evolves and, you know, uh, took us to a time when uh, the organized movement would be less tainted or would be tainted with less violence. And you have the emergence of a civil rights movement uh, dating back to the 1861 and particularly developing in the 50s and the 60s, because by then you had emancipation in 1862, reconstruction in 1865 and 1877. But unfortunately, in spite of all those essential episodes in American history, the plight the fate of the Amer Black American people were not improved. And not only in the Emancipation Movement and in Reconstruction, but even in the Declaration of Independence of the United States, you know, all those movements was enshrined with a need to give people their rights in order to live decently. The American Revolution was against the tyranny of a British king. Emancipation and reconstruction relate to the internal, uh, you know, political affairs in the United States between the North and the South. Even if the emancipation of slavery 
the only reason, it was one of the essential reasons. And spite, in spite of, well, I mean, whatever, you know, whatever amendment was introduced in the Constitution was defeated by the white supremacists. So with that, black Americans were still marginalized and confined to a second class citizenship condition. And as I told you, in spite of a various amendment, there is a famous film relating to the amendment and it's called 13s. And I would like you, would invite you to see it if you haven't. But those amendments, you know, the 13th amendment, the 14th amendment of the constitution, you know, were legal decisions which were not followed by, uh, you know, the, the determination of the uh, uh, general American people to recognize uh, the, 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 the right of the black Americans to enjoy all the opportunities, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, all the opportunities which should be opened up to them in the, in the, in the, uh, in the new, in the new edit. This developed now a type of progress with all the civil rights movements you know, a lot from the 90s, 19, no, the 40s to the 60s with, you know, uh, signal actions, signal movements, signal protest act related to the Emmett Till incident. You remember that young man from the north going south and then being accused of, etc. And the Rosa Park bus biker boycott in Montgomery, Alabama. And this is exactly when, in 1955, emerged the key leader of a civil rights movement, the key leader of mass organization in African-American uh, history, that is to say, Martin Luther King. Uh, Martin Luther King uh, uh, initiative with other people in the 60s, uh, uh, you know, certainly gave uh, the black people opportunity to gain a lot of ground in terms of rights to vote, rights to be representative of a people, right to express themselves and their total freedom. Uh, but, you know, even in, in the 90s, we realized that whatever step or whatever ground was covered, it was not enough. The, all the grounds for full emancipation, for full human rights, were not covered. And that's how you had another movement which is extremely important. That is the One Million Man March in, this, in DC on October 16, 1995, with Louis Farahan, uh, you know, the National African American Leadership Summit, the Nation of Islam, and dozen of other civil rights movements, uh, and the NACP getting together, you know, to stage that million march, man march, which was a repeat, of course, of the march of Martin Luther King uh, uh, in, 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 in DC. Uh, all these culminating in what we have now, which is the Black Lives Matter, nonviolent civil disobedience movement, protesting particularly police brutality, and which culminated in the George Floyd uh, episode. Because what you can note is the uh, Black Lives Matter started in 2013, but it was not very much in the limelight. limelight. And it was not accepted by uh, you know, everybody. Now it is accepted after the George Floyd incident. Because what you saw in the past week were all the, uh, you know, if you want, all the section of the American population getting together and staging all those protests and marches. That's why President Obama said that uh, Black Lives Matter was a protest, a major national protest, like the protest staged by Martin Luther King. But what he said, there was a difference. And the signal difference is that for this time, it was not uh, a vast majority of black people supported by a few whites that were demonstrating. It was a vast majority of all sections 
of the American population who, who are demonstrating in order for right opportunities to be given of people who so far have been trampled down in the United States social uh, uh, fabric. And of course, uh, the Black Lives Matter was uh, sparked after uh, the murder of uh, young Trayvon Martin uh, and, uh, you know, the person who murdered him was acquitted uh, unfairly. Uh, and we remember the name of all those young African-American uh, Opal Tometi, Alicia Gaza, and uh, the third one who staged the, the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, uh, so it is really uh, the George Floyd episode which made of it a movement which is now nationwide and which is being replicated all over the world, including, of course, Senegal. Maybe in the discussion, if you want to hear about certain developing in Senegal, I would certainly be happy to tell you about those movements. We have talked about political movements, but we should not forget that there was other social movements, which also contributed to, you know, uh, making the black voice heard in the United States and elsewhere in the world. It may be in the musical area, it may be in film industry, it may be in other sections. We tend to focus on the political movement, but we should, uh, you, you, we should remember that, you know, the, the Afro do is a movement of protest. Kneeling down, and having your fist up you know, is a movement of defiance. And it did not simply start last year with the uh, footballer in the United States. You remember a number of episodes in the Olympic Games where you have those celebrities in Af African-American sports uh, uh, having their fist up and having their black belts after the Black Panther movement. All those are movements we should be put together. Then, uh, you know, all those initiatives made by people, staged by the American, African American people, supported by other sections of the African American population to say, enough, we can't breathe, and it is high time that we get our rights back. So maybe I could stop here and uh, give a floor to the next speaker. Thank you very much. That, that's great. Thank you so much for that, Professor Sen. Um, and as, as Professor Sen said, that if you have any questions that are specifically directed towards speakers, you can save that for the Q&A, or as I said earlier, send me the question, put it in the chat if you want. Um, but thank you so much for that sort of um, thinking about this more broadly in terms of the historical um, resistance. I think that's really, really important to remember and to think about and understand when we're th thinking about Black Lives Matter in the contemporary moment as well. And I, I for one, would quite encourage people to ask about Black Lives Matter in Senegal and what that, what's going on in the Q&A. <laughs> well. um, but thank you for that. That was really, really great. Um, next up is Debbie Irving, um, who I believe is, 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 in, is, is here. Um, so yeah, De Debbie, yes, okay, I can see you waving. Um, so Debbie brings to racial justice the perspective of working as a nonprofit manager and classroom teacher for 25 years without understanding racism and systemic or her own whiteness as an obstacle to grappling with it. She is the author of the book Waking Up White and in it she has a story called Finding Myself in the Story of Race, which tells the story of how she went from being well-meaning to well-doing. So over to you, um, Debbie, for your just first initial um, contributions. Thank you. And I think I also got the time mixed up. I'm so sorry I'm late and that I missed a minute of this incredible conversation. Uh, I enter the conversation a little bit differently. I'm not in academia myself. And so I use a lot of story to both understand racism for myself and to convey what, how I understand racism with other white people. I uh, very much identify as a white woman who is here to work with other white people to understand how racism has eluded us, how we have been shaped by Alana, I loved your language, the technology of, of whiteness. And my personal story uh, goes like this. I was born in 1960. I grew up in a wealthy suburb outside of Boston. And I call it my white bubble. And then I went on to Kenyon College in Ohio, another white bubble. And what happened to me in these white spaces 
is what I will spend the rest of my life unpacking because I really feel I was nothing short of brainwashed because I had uh, no access to anybody what pe but uh, other than white people in my white household, in my white schools, in my white church, in my white town, um, and in the white circles outside of my white town that we moved in, uh, that we moved in. Um, even the media in the 1960s and 70s that I was exposed to, and this is still to a large extent true, was completely white dominated. And it was shoving at me this narrative again and again of, of um, the white, the all American ideal, which was very much middle class. It was Anglo, Anglo passing. Uh, we didn't use the language cisgender de then, but it was certainly cisgender passing. It was heterosexual passing. It was Christian passing. Um, there were strong elements of class, ableism, and it was certainly white. And so all of those things became not just normalized for me, but the right way of being. Because I was told again and again that the United States was the greatest country on earth. And if this is what the United States was valuing, well then my family better fit right into that little tiny mold that we were being told was the right way to be, the all American way to be. So, um, you know, I'm the kind of person who would have said, until I started uh, really understanding and uh, unpacking race and racism and my own whiteness, I would have been the kind of person who would have said to you, I just love everybody. I don't even see color. We all just need to get along. And I also would have said, well, we don't have any racism in my town because we're all white. So this is the level of deception that, um, that I was exposed to and that I bought into. I think one of the, um, I'm writing a second book now about whiteness and, uh, and breaking it down into bits and pieces. And one of the bits and pieces is denial and the role of denial that is cultivated within white spaces to look on the bright side, to ignore harsh truths, the harsh truths outside of myself and the harsh truths inside of myself. Uh, in this conversation, the harshest truth is that I was absolutely raised to be a white supremacist in a in a um, a wolf in sheep's clothing kind of a way. You know, not a hood wearing white supremacist, but a smiling one that tells you that racism doesn't really exist, and I'm certainly not racist. Um, in the white bubble, I was exposed again and again, really every day, I think, to ideas about the playing field being level. So this is the big myth of meritocracy. And, and I, I do all of uh, my work. I frame it. Um, I don't pretend I'm anything other than someone who understands how racism operates in the United States. So I really don't know how some of what I'm speaking translates outside of US borders. Uh, this myth of meritocracy in the United States is so potent. It, it's baked into language like life, liberty, justice for all. You know, people come from all over the world to the United States to pursue the American dream. The myth will tell you that it's accessible to everybody. All you have to do is work hard. This is the land of the free. This is the land of opportunity from sea to shining sea. It's one nation indivisible. And all of that happy language, which goes very nicely with denial, uh, really allowed me, encouraged me to buy into the fact that I was living in a free and fair country. And so one of the effects that had on me is when I got out of my white bubble and I started noticing in, in Boston and other cities, this really clear pattern of uh, neighborhoods that were different by, by race. So black and brown neighborhoods that were um, marked by school buildings with broken windows school classrooms. I was a teacher, so I was moving in that world. Uh, classrooms that had books that were held together literally with duct tape. Um, no, not a lot of greenery, meaning lawns and trees. And then I would look at white neighborhoods and there were lawns, there were trees, there were single family houses, there were always new roads being built, new schools being built. And how was I to explain that if I believe the playing field is level? And so at a really deep level, I bought into the idea of biological difference, that somehow white people were superior. And this is what explained white people 
um, succeeding according to the American dreams, very profit-centered, uh, inhumane, you know, non-human centered version of success. So I did buy into ideas of gender superiority that put me on the one down in that category of racial superiority. And um, these ideas are so deep that it takes a lot of work for me to undo them. It takes a lot of vigilance because my whiteness will again and again want to tell me that I'm superior in one way or another. And so Alana, when you talk about race, um, you know, shape shifting. I notice it does that at the institutional and the ideological level. It also does within me, I notice. So I'm constantly trying to find ways to uh, self-validate in ways that are not healthy, that are ways that are trying to put me above another person as opposed to recognizing uh, that w the second one of us goes one up or one down, we're no longer connecting as healthy individuals. So. I, um, you know, I develop very wrong-headed ideas about what's normal and, and this whole better, wet, worse syndrome. And so I wrote this book, uh, Waking Up White, because I felt like, okay, I got to the age of 22. I get set free in Boston, first to be an arts administrator and raise money uh, for after-school programs for inner city kids. And I think I'm equipped to do that. I know nothing about the history of redlining in the United States for anyone who doesn't know that. It's a, it's a, it's a highly racialized lending and housing engineered program that came out of the New Deal in the 1930s. It put down a housing footprint in cities all over the United States that is still very much intact. And so there are a lot of white people who come out of white bubbles who then get set to go help and fix the poor black and brown children in these neighborhoods as if the people are flawed. Um, and and when, we, when we don't understand the system, um, I'm an example of that. I didn't know about the system, so I tried to help and fix people. And of course, that uh, did little other than make me feel good about myself and didn't really help anybody at all. I didn't know I was the one who need, who need help and fixing. So that's what this story is about. Um, I think about, you know, so now because I spent so many years in, in, that, in that locked off uh, space of whiteness, it's still very visceral to me. So I feel like I, I have my own version of double consciousness. And so I always think in terms of before and after. So if we think about COVID right now um, in the United States, and I know this is a global phenomenon as well, um, COVID is impacting uh, indigenous black and brown bodies very differently at, you know, in higher rates of infection, higher rates of death than it is white people. So if I hadn't started to wake up and understand systems and structures and, and a 400 plus year old movement of, of uh, you know, protests and, and mutinies and riots that I had never learned about, if I didn't start to wake up and understand all of that, I would still be explaining COVID um, disproportional impact on, on peoples of color as a biological difference. I would never have said that because I was taught that, taught that speaking about race was rude. Um, and so I would have silently affirmed these really archaic ideas about biological difference. Of course, I can now say, well, you know, if, if, if by social design in the United States, we've got black and brown bodies and indigenous people, um, you know, sequestered and cramped and crowded some standard living conditions and disproportionately in frontline jobs because that's a social role expected of black and brown and indigenous people in the United States. So now we've got cramped and crowded housing, frontline roles, maybe not, um, and, and relying on public transportation to get to these jobs where you're in buses and subways and lack of access your whole life to healthcare. Of course, black, indigenous and peoples of color are experiencing higher rates. And yet I still hear the discourse, the common discourse is not to mention the systems and structures that lead to that differential impact. The narrative is still playing field as level. Um, and the other thing, you know, the Breathe Act, the defund the police that's happening here, if not for having started to wake up. And by the way, I don't think I'm woke. I think I will be waking up for the rest of my life. Um, I, 
with the defund the police or reimagine the police as is language some other people are uh, some people are starting to use here and the breathe act i see people just freaking out white people freaking out with the idea of defunding the police without even stopping to ask the question well boy i'd like to learn more about how defund the police works so this is another aspect of the culture of whiteness is to go for an immediate judgment as opposed to still our bodies wonder what am i afraid of what do i need to learn how can i engage in this conversation um, so instead there's a lot of reaction about defund the police and yet the discourse around defund the police is incredibly exciting and if i again if i hadn't started waking up i think that i would have been silently in that reactionary place it would have felt scary to me because after all if i've been taught in my formative years that black brown and indigenous people are somehow um, scary a threat to society a threat to white female me burdening our society by living off the government um, if that's what i truly believe then defunding the police is a scary idea if i if i understand differently uh, the humanity and the and the dehumanization that has happened through policing and other structures then i understand as i do now that in order for any one of us to reclaim our humanity everyone's humanity has to be centered and i believe that starts with centering the humanity of the people who are the most marginalized and the most impacted by white supremacist uh technology i really like that word alana so i think that's where i'll stop that's great. Thank you so much, uh, Debbie, for that. And just another quick reminder, I know I keep saying this, but if you have any questions, you can save them for the Q&A, but you can also put them in the chat or send them directly to me and I'll collect them. If you want it to be addressed to a particular speaker, then let me know. Um, uh, but yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, and to move on to our last speakers, who I am really, really glad are here today with us and i'm really looking forward to hear what they um have to say and um, the who are the triple cripples and um, the triple cripples were created by kim oliver and jamoke Abdul abdullahi and um, is a groundbreaking platform created to increase the visibility and highlight the narratives of black and non-black women femmes and non-binary people of color living with disabilities whose stories would otherwise remain hidden from view the intersections of race, gender and disability are key factors in determining how people experience the world around them. Yet so often, these axes of oppression are often overlooked in disability activism, feminist agendas and black liberation movements. And so I'm going to hand over to the triple cripples now. Hello, um, thank you for the introduction, um, Dr. Goodfellow. Um, I'm Jamoke Abdullahi of the Triple Cripples. Hi, I'm Kim Oliver of the Triple Cripples. Um, Jimmy, do you wanna um, just do a brief introduction of who we are and what we do? And then- we'll... Yes, of course. Yeah, yeah, then we'll leap right in. Um, so as um, Maya had touched upon, uh, we are the triple cripple. So what we do is essentially um, try to utilize the, the medium and try and increase and highlight um, the narratives and increase the visibility of those that experience lives in the way that we do. So those that have been placed um, quite meticulously and on purpose in the margins of the margins of the margins of the margins um, throughout history. And it's something that's continued to be done so. And we're very aware of the impact that um, representation or a lack thereof has on the lived experiences of people like us. It affects education, it affects health, it affects uh, personal relationships, it affects absolutely everything that you could possibly think of. And it always affects it in the negative. So we understand and are aware of the tool that the media is the tool that you get through tv shows um movies uh through books through radio through absolutely everything in the quite subtle and very coercive ways in which it tells a certain tale over and over again and it need not be true but if it's said enough it becomes the truth and what happens is people like us are always on the suffering end of these um of these actions and these these acts and of those that are um, 
on the privileged side of life, be they white, be they cisgendered, uh, be they uh, non-disabled, et cetera, et cetera, uh, used this tool, uses white people and white people also use this tool in order to aid themselves and um, corroborate and back and construct themselves in a certain way that you are both the victim and the victim. And that's what we are essentially trying to battle against. Mm. Yeah, and I think what's a key thing that Jamoke mentioned is that we are in a position now where we are becoming more aware of the fact that there's erasure of certain groups, right? But even with, if we just talk about Black Lives Matter, even within this particular movement, there is an erasure of certain black people, certain types of black people, who gets to be black and who gets to be important. If we just talk about what's going on in the US, we will talk about what's going on in the UK shortly, but what's going on in the US, we're very focused around um, police brutality directed towards male victims. We don't talk about the trans women who get killed. We don't talk about the trans man, Tony McDad, who got killed. We very rarely talk about the women. Um, in fact, Breonna Taylor has kind of faded into the, just <laughs> the periphery as if somehow her life was not necessarily as important um, and it wasn't taken as brutally, but what was more important was the one that we saw was George Floyd. Now, Every, when we're saying Black Lives Matter, we mean every single life matters. That we don't talk about the disabled people that are killed by police every single day. If we just talk about the US, disabled Black people are high in number in terms of those who are killed by police. So we have to be able to see all of those lives as having value. And I remember reading somewhere um, a few weeks ago that it's not just if you're compliant, it's not just if you're pleasant, it's not just if you're wearing the right things, it's not just if you're educated like the gentleman who the um, white lady tried to um, call on camera and say that uh, he was attacking her when we all saw that he wasn't and that they were like oh he's from he's studied this and he's you know he's a, not a threat because he's educated and it's like no that is irrelevant what we're saying is that black it, black lives matter in all of their iterations and one of the things that triple cripples tries to do is say black disabled women and femmes matter um because as jamoke rightly said we are erasure is our demise us being a race literally affects all of our outcomes and leads to higher fatality rates um, and sometimes it means we don't even get the gift of life because the way in which we are viewed or not viewed rather means that someone something a being like us is not supposed to exist so in order to combat that and kind of directly fly in the face of that kind of discrimination we need to be seen, we need to be spoken about, we need our stories to be told. Um, and so yes, we utilize the media, we do lectures and we talk about the intersections of race, of gender, of ability. That's kind of what triple cripples means, right? The triple um, pronged marginalization that we experience. And each of those intersections can be crippling in their own way, whether it's you're facing um, misogyny, whether you're experiencing racism, whether you're experiencing ableism, having all three operate at the same time all the time is horrific and horrendous. Someone said earlier that, you know, we shouldn't be talking about who experiences um, things worse and who has worse experiences of discrimination but the fact is if we're really going to confront things and be honest in society and make a better world we have to look at the fact that people within the margins of the margins of the margins have a worse experience of life than others we cannot pretend that somehow as long as ideologically we're in a place where we are open to creating a better world that that somehow means that people don't have worse experiences than others that is just what it is that is the world we've created is one where inequity pervades and so we have to be able to name those inequities and admit and see them and call them for what they are right jim okay um i will let you um before i go on to the other part of what we're going to say. <laughs> right, okay. Um, something that uh, Kim had touched upon is the fact that um, 
living life the way that we do. We cannot separate our blackness from our womanhood and we cannot separate our womanhood from, you know, the fact that we are disabled. And with white supremacy, racism, anti-black racism and ableism and sexism and queer phobia and all of these things, they actually work hand in hand. There is no one way to try and pull, extract um, one from the other because depending, it might be more weighted to one thing than the other, but you are being affected and you are being punished by all of these identities of which you hold, which white supremacy feels is something that is going against its very existence. And what mm -hmm. white supremacy essentially is at the very root of it is violence. And in order to be able to enact that violence, anything that gets in the way of that will be pushed out of the way. Now, as um, mentioned earlier by a um, couple of the uh, speakers, the ways in which white supremacy and whiteness itself molds itself and changes itself and it makes itself suitable to any sort of situation is also the ways in which those that are not white are punished because the goalpost is so often moved for us, is it not? I mean, for myself and for Kim and for so many others like us, might we have been able to get a book deal to be yeah. able to talk about our experiences of life. Like, yeah. hey, I am being punished because of the way that I am. We mm. wouldn't even be let into the room. Yes. And we it's, wouldn't and be it, let it, in. We wouldn't. We wouldn't. And it's no, it's, and it, in, on that subject, we're here talking about Black Lives Matter, right? And we, on the panel, we have two white women who are promoting their books, right? And to speak to what Jim Kerr is saying, we have to look at what that means and what that looks like. We have to see that that on the surface of it, though the books may be um, wonderful and have um, great value. We have to look at that. And we also have to look at that during this time, Robin D'Angelo's book was a number one bestseller in June after a black person was killed. Like somehow there are not black scholars, there are not black writers, there are not mm. black people who have expertise in the area of telling their own stories from an academic point of view or from a non-academic point of view. Yeah. Like somehow the gatekeepers of knowledge are still, even in this moment, are white people. Yes. And they're being centered even in this moment. And so we have to think about what these these mean. Who gets to know? You know, who who gets access? Is is knowledge being is there a gatekeeper of knowledge? And who is that gatekeeper and why? We have to challenge these things. We have to question these things. Because saying that, oh well, you know, they're writing um in in favor of creating a better world is one thing, but the world that we've created is one that says that, you know, in terms of um, white supremacist ideas of pedagogy is one that says that whiteness is the epitome, right? Yeah. Of yes. knowledge. Yes, they are the gatekeepers of, the of knowledge. Of all, yes, and so we have to look at those things. We have to look at the fact that we are in a society that only co-signs right now the Black Lives Matter movement because there are non-Black people with us. We have to look at that. Um, it's, that's one of the reasons why Triple Cripples is so important because we are defying those ideas by saying, well, we aren't even supposed to exist, but we will choose to tell our own stories. We will choose to be in control of our own narrative, right? Regardless of whether you want it or not. Um, and in doing that, in so doing that, in taking up space as black women do, that's what black women do, mm, right? They absolutely, always absolutely. take up space. Other people's liberation is tied to ours. We always talk about the idea that it's important that we start from the margins of the margins. So where you are starting from the most marginalized people and centering their needs, centering them, making them the cornerstone for the society you want to build, no one else is going to fall through the gaps because you've made sure that all of those tiny little holes are plugged, right? And so I think it's important that we um, talk about that. Just a quick point before I hand back over to Jamal Kerr. I've heard the phrase black bodies being thrown around a lot. We are black people. We're not cargo. 
we're not hollow, we're not disposable, and we're not dead. And I think language is a key component or of how we view and have viewed race. There was a point in time where black people were viewed as cargo. They were viewed as objects, they were viewed as disposable. And it's very important that we do not rewrite those narratives with our language, that we do not reinvent them or reintroduce them into society, to, and which allows them to, it allows people to justify our dehumanization, right? It allows people, well, if you are just a body, what is it? We only call dead people bodies, people that have no longer, are no longer here people that no longer have what we would call capitalist value, we call those bodies, right? And so if we're talking about living beings in that way, we are still carrying on the narrative of white supremacy in, in many ways. And so that is important. Um, just before I, I keep saying I'm gonna hand over to you. I know, and it doesn't get handed <laughs> over, interesting. Just one minute, let me put on my glasses. Um, so we're here talking about Black Lives Matter, and I think it's very important that we acknowledge the great impact that Black Lives Matter has had on the entire world, right? It's important that we acknowledge it, and it's important that we honor the fact that it was started by disabled queer women, right? Not disabled queer women, but by queer women, um, or queer femmes. Queer black women. Queer black femmes, right? Who, <laughs> in a lot of ways, are not necessarily being fought for, in their, own, in their own movement. And so that is an important point. But it's also important to note that we're talking about England not being exempt from the crimes um, committed against black people, against the crimes of injustice and police brutality. They are not. In 1998, um, Sean Rigg, sorry, in 2008, Sean Rigg um, died in a similar way actually to George Floyd, um, four officers held him down face down and he died of cardiac arrest they held him face down for eight and a half minutes i think it was eight yeah eight and a half minutes it was recorded as well because in 2008 we did have mobile phones it was recorded and none of the footage was used none of the um police officers got prosecuted nothing happened it it was just what it was and it's England has a very long history of colonialism, enslavement, police brutality, racism. This is the, this is the hub, right? This is the, um, the mother and father of white supremacy. And so the ways in which it will display will not necessarily be the same as the US, right? Um, if we're talking about disabled black people being disproportionately affected by police brutality, that's still true here. When we talk about Sarah Reed, um, we talk about Rocky Bennett, who was in 1998 died in Norwich um, Mental Hospital. So seven, I think, seven people held him face down for 25 minutes. No one was prosecuted. Like that is that, and those, I'm talking about old things. I'm not even talking about new things or current things. More people die of police, in police custody here. They don't carry around guns. They don't, you know. Um, openly commit acts of injustice but yet disproportionately we're in prison disproportionately we're institutionalized which is something that the un even in 2017 that when they did their inquiry they found that the uk like was they were particularly concerned with the number of black people being held against their will being held and they didn't believe that it was lawful they didn't believe that it was in line with human rights right and so we're looking at somewhere that knowingly and on a global scale is acknowledged for ignoring the rights of black people, of, of black women, especially because they were concerned about women and girls as well. Everyone knows that this is the status quo, that the status quo is to dehumanize, to murder, to kill, to destroy the opportunities of, to block, to ruin the um, attainment of, but yet nothing is done nothing is said and so we're coming with black lives matter has highlighted even things systemic issues that have been going on in the uk for time in memoriam um, we have people who've been working in social justice here for years years and years and years um, 
but because of the way the system is set up, because of the nature of the laws, because of the nature and how old the system is and how small the population of black and brown people is, it is very difficult for us to have the voice or the, um, the effect that perhaps people across the seas in the US would have. So that's why it's so important that when we have these movements, we connect with others around the world because your voice adds to my voice and my voice give, gives context to your experience. And so TC is important, Triple Cripples is very important as an example of what is possible when you look at the world from outside. And I love what was said earlier about looking at the world from outside of your bubble. Jim, okay. Right, it's my turn. Um, <laughs> as um, Kim had rightly mentioned and what is um, so often true um, in the history of anything ever, um, black women are, we are at the forefront of everything, um, be it uh, creativity, be it services that are actually required. And one name um, that certainly pops up is the name of uh, Julie J. Charles, who's actually the um, chief executive and founder of Equalities National Council, um, mm. an organization that was set up here in, <clears throat> excuse me, in England. Now in places such as the UK, which is, um, which was and continues to be a leading exporter in colonialism, in racism, in everything terrible under the sun that you could imagine, including homophobia, by the way. Yeah. Um, it is so often black women because we are so often at the receiving end of punishment by the white supremacist states that we make it our business to take care of our own because we know that nobody is actually around here for us and in yeah. the creation of the um equalities national council which is the only one in the uk that actually focuses on and centers the um needs of black and minority ethnic um disabled users and disabled people it was a black woman that started it Triple Cripples was started by two black women. All of these things, all of these movements that take us to the right side of life, to the right side of history is so often created by us. Yeah. Um, I'm sure um, most of you here would have heard about um, a city in um, England, uh, Bristol, where the statue of a former um, slave merchant, slave owner by the name of Edward Colston had uh, finally been taken down because people no longer want they could no longer wait. They had petitioned. They had gone through the right way of trying to get this thing removed for years, upon years, mm. upon years, upon years, years. They like, we're not, we, we've had enough. We're going to take it down. Mm. That plinth in which he stood was then replaced by the uh, statue of a black woman. I mm. believe, uh, Jen Reed. 24 hours later, it was removed. Yeah. 24 yeah. hours later, it was removed. It took less time because actually acknowledging the plight, the fight, and the righteousness of people, of black women, is not mm -hmm. something that this country actually wants to acknowledge. They'll acknowledge mm -hmm. it in the through through ways. I'll give you an award. I'll do this. I'll do that. I'll mm -hmm. give you a sticker, uh, some sort of mark or some sort of signifier, but mm -hmm. actually changing laws and making sure mm -hmm. that they are actually beneficial to everybody is not something that they're actually committed yeah, to. I want to be committed to it and I want to write about stuff. Window dressing. And one thing that's important about that statue as well is that it wasn't a black sculptor. And yet again, we see who is the gatekeeper of certain arenas, right? It wasn't a black sculptor that made it, it was a white sculptor. So we've got a white sculptor making a sculpture of a black experience, replacing the sculpture of a white person talking about a white experience. And so once again, who, who are we saying is worthy of telling our story, but also who are we saying has the expertise even within the arts, right? And so it's important that we look at all of these things and try and change them. In line with what Jamoke was saying, there's a woman called Caroline Nelson, who was the chief executive of Choice in Hackney for over 10 years. And it, it's an organization that provides advocacy, advocacy services for disabled people. And she remained one of the only black disabled women to head a disabled people's organization in London. We are in 2020 and that 
ne hasn't necessarily shifted, right? And so when we talk about wanting structural change, are we talking about having events like this one? Or are we talking about people mobilizing within their fields? Are we talking about people petitioning to change laws? Are we talking about people like us entering into the political arena to do the kind of disruption from the inside as well as people organizing on the outside? Are we really talking about defunding the police and redistributing wealth? One of the things that I, I find interesting is that we talk about privilege and we talk about changing the way things, the, the experiences that black and brown and indigenous people have around the world. But are we willing to redistribute our wealth in our personal lives? Are we willing to actually give away opportunities that perhaps we could easily have been afforded to us? We could easily take, we could easily accept for our own personal development. But are we, are we willing to do the things that actually redress the balances in our own personal lives, as well as, yes, working structurally and systemically? But let's face it, the structure and the system is maintained by those within it. And so once again, going back to kind of medical racism and you know the idea of these intersections, I can, you can hire 150 black doctors today. They are still going to enter into a racist medical system that has a particular culture and a particular way of dealing with black people. We always talk about um, this particular story. We were at a, the um, Content is Queen podcast festival in 2018 and we met some young doctors and one of them, you know, had just started practicing a young black woman and she was talking about doing the hospital round. So she'd gone round, she'd gone to every patient, done their little summary, and she'd, she had a black male patient, she'd done his summary or whatever. They'd gotten into the round, the round table or whatever discussion it is that doctors have where they discuss each patient and talk about what they're going to do in order to kind of take their, their care further or kind of change things in order to, for the betterment of the patient or whatever. And she said that they got to the point where they were talking about the black patient and everyone just kind of glossed over it, didn't bother to go through the chart like they'd done for every single other patient. And in that moment, she didn't speak up because she's a new doctor. What is she to do? How is she to challenge her seniors? And obviously, if that's what they've done, maybe they know better and maybe it's the right thing. If you are in a system like that where we, we already have hold doctors and things like that in high regard because we're like, you know, they've gone to school for seven years, so they know better. They know better than me. You know, they're supposed to be healers, right? So you go with the idea of these people being healers, but also if you're in the industry, you go with knowing these people have more experience than you, right? So therefore, the way they're treating the black patients must be the way they're supposed to treat the black patients, right? That lack of intervention where they, they're ignoring um, heart murmurs because, oh, the black women are just exaggerating. That's leading to black women having higher rates of um, heart disease and coronary heart failure and all of these things and cardiac arrest. Like, that must be okay because these doctors know better. And so even if I come in as a person of color, I will just repeat the things that I've seen by the time it gets to a point where I am in position and I am in power, I am my predecessors. So we can't just talk about putting more faces. Oh, let me do a, a hire. Let me do a few hires. We have to think about fundamentally changing the way we think about all of these systems and implementing that change in our personal lives, but also in our public lives, also in our work lives, also in the laws that we make and the things that we agree to and the affiliations we have. It is it is both a personal and public and social problem. Um, and it cannot be ignored because these are people's lives. And I don't care if you feel that it doesn't affect you personally. Um, I'm sure that there are lots of people who thought that um, many things like COVID would not affect them personally, but yet it has, right? And so we have to make this our responsibility. And as people who are descendants of oppressors, colonizers, the oppressed, the enslaved, we have a duty to make the world a better place, but especially those who are on the side of history that has benefited from the oppression of others. It is- And continues to benefit. Yes, and continue to benefit because that's just the way the system is set up and continues to work. You can't point to a few successful black people or black um, 
leaders and say, oh, but you know, look, they've got their own presidents in Africa and the Caribbean now, so therefore it's fine. Who's in control of the resources? Who, and these are all basic things I'm saying, but we do not take those things into consideration when we're talking about dismantling system and assessing our own privilege. <laughs> We have, yeah. to, we have to look at all of these factors and we have to make a difference. And we have to start, as we've said, from the margins. Who is benefiting the least? Who is the most affected? Are we talking about trans, disabled, black, indigenous people of color? We have to start from the margins of the margins and make that our duty and make that our center. If you're not doing that, then you're not doing any anti-racism work. You're not doing any feminist, intersectional feminist work. You're not doing any kind of liberation work. You're not doing any socialist, any whatever you want to affiliate yourself with, you might as well not do it. Because if you're not including everyone, then it is, you're going to recreate the world that we already have agreed is not That is important though. Uh... Yeah, time is important. Yeah, yeah. Oh, are you telling me? Are you telling me that I'm? We should stop, Uncle. No, it's excellent, but I may, maybe we should make of it more of a conversation than a monologue, though. Oh, are you do you want to ask me a question? Well, yeah, certainly, and others, Go especially for it. those people who haven't spoken. That was excellent, but maybe those listening to us, we need to give them a floor to speak too. Right. I'm sure that I've seen yeah. questions coming up, so we're more than happy to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Do, do, you, want, right. do you want to conclude? Do you want to take a few more minutes to conclude? Yeah, yeah, Jim, I can conclude. Uh, yeah, I'll just, I'll wrap everything up. Uh, thank you so much for that. Um, just to um, close the fact that um, so often with the way that the world has been set up and why triple cripples is so necessary is that any time that a black life is um, taken, is violently taken, is um, whiteness profits. Whiteness profits through being elected, whiteness profits through being given grants to help, to help. Whiteness profits every single time one of our lives is um, taken, either explicitly, implicitly, the lives that we do know about, the lives that we don't know about. And the only way for us to actually be able to truly say that we value these lives and that we are, we are trying to do the work is that we have to actually see these people and that's what we are trying to do with triple cripples and until you see people until you see the variety the beautiful varieties of people of humanity that is out there you won't actually be able to take it in and um yeah i don't know i've lost my train of thought through that um that that delightful thing but yeah um We've got, we've got, we've all got a lot it's of- all right, black women are always being interrupted. Black women are always being interrupted. Yeah, imagine it would be us to be interrupted. But um, we all have work to do. We certainly all have work to do. But those of us that um, are on the benefiting side, there's a lot more work to be done. There's a lot more work to be done. For everything that you are paid for, you need to make sure that you are redistributing the wealth and actually truly question, if you had not been white, if you had not been cis, if you had not been whatever it might be, would you have been given these opportunities and then act accordingly? Because unless you are actually actively doing that, like Kim said, any extra monikers that you're putting at the end of the name, at the end of your name, it doesn't mean anything. So peace out. Thank you so much for that. Kim, did you want to add anything else? Because I, I know you sort of halfway through a, a sentence, I think. So it's No, I, ju I think that in some ways that what, what took place was important to note because that is exactly something that happens always happens to black friends. Yeah. We are silenced um, and interrupted. And I think that's an important it's a wonderful lesson for all of those present. So I'm done. Thank you very much for having us. Actually, we have questions for you because we are fascinated by your presentation and as you were speaking i was wondering i wanted to ask you a question but i did not want to interrupt you while you were speaking uh, and yet it happened anyway yeah, if are, okay yeah if you are crippled and white or if you are transgender and white right and if you are the same thing and black what would be the more comfortable position as we had mentioned earlier, there is no way to try and separate one from the other. We are all three at the exact same time. There's no 
way to try and pull apart or try and dismantle or take apart um, any of our identities or the way that we live life. We are affected by ableism, sexism, and racism at, um, at different moments, at different parts, but there's no way to try and extract or put a number or percentage point on it, no. Thank you. I hope that answers yeah, that no, question. Yeah, thank you for that. Sorry, I was I didn't um I, I was just gonna say that we maybe it would help to take questions in sets of threes. Also we have three if that works for everyone, because there's a, a it's already a hand up a few questions that have been sent in. So if anyone who wants to ask a question, um if you could put your hand up in the in the chat. So there's a little hand up function if you click on the chat function. Um, or if you don't want to ask it yourself, you can send it to me or put it in the chat for everyone to see so that in that same chat function. Um, and just to say, sorry, because it, it's now, thank you very much for that, um, to the Triple Cripples for, for your interventions. And there's a lot of um, love in the chat for you as well, as you were talking as well about what you were saying. So I just wanted to make a note of that you know you went you covered a lot of ground and you shared with us a lot of things that I think are really important for people to reflect upon and I would encourage anyone if you have questions to to share them now in the chat as well there's a few already that have been sent through um so I think Alpha someone called Alpha um is your name yeah that um it, yeah your hand I see up here and also in the chat and um, so if we could come to you and then I also have some written questions but if anyone else do the hand up function in the chat don't do it on your video because I won't see you Right. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Um, I am a, a Senegalese person living in London for quite a while now. Um, so, Usman Jirajef. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, I'm also a member of, of UAC, um, in because I visited that when I come to Senegal. Okay. So, um, I wanted to tell uh, the audience that there is in Senegal, there is an island called Gore, which is the um, an island where slaves were kept and shipped to America. And if you have the opportunity, once obviously it is safe to do so, and I understand the government of Senegal has released, um, the um, international flight now is open on the 15th of July. Um, you are quite welcome to go there, and I'm looking forward myself to going there uh, because I've been living here for quite a while. Um, but there's one thing that I wanted to focus culturally first and then politically. Culturally, I know that when I was born, I was black. I was in pink. When I grew up, I was black. I wasn't, I wasn't green. When I go out in the sun, in the beach, I'm black. I'm not red. When I'm cold, I'm black. I'm not blue. And when I die, I would be black, not purple. Therefore, I have never in my life used colored. I say I'm a black person and there is a white person. When I was at school, in high school, I was told that the only thing that hasn't got color or order was water. So therefore, please can we stop using colored people? We are black and they are white. End of story. Now, the second thing I wanted to mention is I gave a talk um, to a branch Labour Party in London, uh, in northwest London, in Brent, and I was talking about Black Lives Matter. And what I said was, I started by quoting Martin Luther King. And I'm going to, if you allow me, I'll quote that speech, because that was very important, Matt. He said, emancipation for the Negro was really freedom to hunger, freedom to the winds and the rains of heaven. It was freedom without food to eat, a land to cultivate. And therefore, it was freedom Americans tell the Negro to lift themselves by their own bootstrap. They don't look over the legacy of slavery and segregation. I believe he said, we all to do all we can and seek lift ourselves by our, own, by our own bootstrap. But it's a cruel justice to say to a bootless man that he ought to lift himself by his own bootstrap. And many Negroes, by the thousands and millions, have been left bootless as a result of all these years of oppression and as a result of a society that deliberately 
makes his color a stigma and something worthless and degrading. That is a big problem. Now, I will relate that to the COVID-19 in the United Kingdom. I mean, if we look at um, the COVID-19, what I find out me is that one postcode is a better predictor of one's health than one's genetic code. Where one's live determines where one's go to school. I am a retired teacher, by the way. Determine the quality of education one receives. Determine one's preparation for higher education. Determine one's access to good job. Determine the quality of neighborhood and housing conditions. And determine, dare I say, the exposure to physical and toxic substances. That is a class issue which hasn't been talked about. And some have argued about class issues. Some have argued that slavery was not a product of racism, but that racism was a product of slavery and economic exploitation. That is to say, racism constitutes myth systems of classification and regime of discourse that naturalize and legitimize the forced servitude and of certain different groups whose labor can be exploited for the purpose of accumulation. I believe, as Marx says, that racism, well, I mean, that wealth, all wealth come from labor. And I think that racism is a tool viciously used to maintain the class structure. So that is an issue that I think needs to be considered. So I thank you very much. Oh yeah, could I just, um, so what was the question exactly, Alpha? Um, well, it was a class issue that needs to be raised. If one can raise the class issue, there's a racism, yes indeed there is, but there's also a link to the class issues. And that needs to be considered, except, except, except um, especially um, during the COVID-19 in, in, in the UK. We've seen that, when I say that the, the BME has got um, a problem with COVID, well, that's because of the housing condition. That's because of, 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 um, of uh, the fact that, you know, the living condition, the austerity that has been going on for 10 years in England. And that needs to be considered. It's a class issue as well as uh, 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 other issues. Oh, so it was issues. a statement, not a question. Right. Okay, thank you so yeah. much, Alfred. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I appreciate your, your talk. Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay, thanks. So maybe if anyone wants to speak to class, I guess, as, a, as, as thinking about class in relation to the discussion thus far, I think that's been raised in some of the contributions, but if anyone has any additional points to make about that. Um, in the chat, there are also a number of questions. Um, so one of the questions that's been asked, that was asked very early on in, in the um, event was, um, could any of you maybe talk a bit more about community-based alternatives to policing? I suppose maybe what does that look like? How might we conceive of that? There's a lot of work that's been done on that. So does, can anyone speak to that specifically? Um, um, someone has also asked, how do you conceive of like, what is, what are identity politics? Is this notion used to undermine progressive movements? How is this rhetoric countered if so? Um, and uh, another question, um, that has been asked specifically to Alana, but I think maybe can also be addressed to everyone. How did it come that one group, white people, came to assume dominant positions so they can construct the world in their image? So there's sort of three questions there that are touching upon different things that have been talked about already in this supplementary question of it as well around if anyone has anything to add to class. Um, but community-based alternatives to policing, identity politics, identity politics, and then this idea about where, I guess, how white people come to so dominant. Um, does anyone want to? Yeah, I'll take the policing question. Great, Stephanie. Um, right. Thank you. Great question. Um, at the moment, what we're attempting to do is review the policing budgets. So right now I'm in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which is a very wealthy city. Um, and it's a city of 100,000 people, and yet the but the police budget is $63 million, which is the third highest uh, budget in the whole city. This is above 
all other um, social services and government administrations um, <laughs> in the city. So we have decided that um, our approach is to review the budget itself and see what money is spent on what. So we are attacking first um, the dismantling of first responses. So um, instituting a, a, a first response team that has mental health services, social, social workers and legal services for the victims, not the police, um, and no armed police officers ever. Um, and we're taking away all social programs that are like linked to the police department, which includes youth work and um, all kinds of social, um, social workers that are housed in the police department. Removing those from the police department themselves and moving those into um, other city budget air, uh, budget items. Um, in addition to that work, <laughs> we are also asking for the removal of police officers from the um, from social housing, from public housing in the in, in Cambridge. Um, that's where they they just station a number of uh, um, police officers, and so we're asking to remove those people because they are pre what they do is that they um they criminalize people they are not proactive they don't prevent any um crimes or violent crimes in particular from taking place they actually instigate it and um we believe that community workers community social workers not um state social workers are the ones who do that um so we should have tackling the budget item by item and just sort of attacking each line in that way. But um, something came up in the previous uh, talk that I, I would also like to address if that's okay. Um, so so I oh. want to thank the triple cripples and I really appreciated that heartfelt breakdown of basically a summation of what each of us had talked about before. Um, and I want to bring up something that I had asked to be asked about, um, which is the concept of body because I'm a feminist scholar. Um, so first, I think it's really important to remember bodies because we cannot neglect the history of the severing of the black mind, the African mind from the from the um, African body. Um, and this is an important legacy of white supremacy. Um, and I also think it's really important to remember the, the concept of matter, um, the literal thing, um, that black people exist, we are literal matter. And for me, this is a direct response to, to the statement, black lives matter too. So a lot of people have asked me, why don't we say Black Lives Matter also or Black Lives Matter too? Well, it's a it's a finite statement. It is saying Black lives are in matter. And so it's factually true that Black lives actually matter. Um, so it makes Blackness the subject by acknowledging the object, which for me is the body. Um, and then also, again, returning to my feminist um, scholarship, it's um, and being concerned with the feminist scale um, so for me, the feminist scale begins with the mind, and next it goes to the body, the home, the state, the global, the universal. And so it is really important to remember the body in our politics, body politics. Um, and we cannot ignore the body when we're talking, when we're discussing disabilities, right? We have to acknowledge the body. But I agree with you guys very much so when you're saying it really matters when, where, why, and how we talk about the body. We can't just say black bodies, black bodies, without acknowledging black lives, the humans inside of those bodies. Um, so I think that's a crucial point. Um, and I especially appreciated your point about um, black minds and black stories matter. <laughs> um, and so I think what I want to propose to the group, especially white allies who are present here, um, is we're asking questions. Where are the funding for black researchers? Black researchers are doing, like taking on debt, taking extra jobs. It's really difficult to write the books that are being um, purchased at the moment. The black scholars who are doing that research really have to suffer to justify their work. So we need funding for that work. So let's do some of that work. And then where are the book deals for black writers? I think this is when and where white allies come in. It's your job to open the door. And then it's your job to reshape those spaces, to work to reshape those spaces, to make them safe and open to Black minds, to Black ideas, and Black stories. That's all. Thank, no, thank you so much for that, Stephanie. We, we have only a few minutes left, and so I, I 
so propose, I, I don't know what the speakers think, um, if maybe if we just hear any concluding mark, remarks that people have in relation to the questions or anything else that maybe you want to add and say, and maybe um, I don't want to put you on the spot, but if we come to the triple quipples um, first, um, given that what Stephanie said, I don't know if you want to engage, like speak to that, yeah. but yeah, just to give you a bit more space because you were cut off earlier as well. So just, yeah. Okay, um, just a quick closing remark for me in terms of um, ways of looking after each other in terms of safety outside of the uh, police state that we know is that um, I am only just beginning that work of even considering a world in which the police aren't involved, like in, in my daily life, in the media that I'm exposed to, that we are all exposed to, the police have always been quite um, a central part of that, either on the good side or on the bad side, but they are always there. But as with everything, as we'd said earlier, black women are always at the forefront of imagining, you know, these various futures in which we have a world in which the police are not present and there is no police presence there's no school to prison pipeline and any of that and um there's a book by um angela davis uh something along the lines of um should we um abolish uh, no our, our prisons obsolete yes that's our prisons obsolete so i definitely say um looking to reading that and um look outside of yourself especially for um those that are on the privileged side of life look outside of yourself because while it might not be for you that um it's something new to you something you've never heard of i promise you i promise you i promise you somebody has already done that work somebody has already done the reimagining and more often than uh, more often than not that is um a black woman but adding on to a future in which um, there are no police. I do, from the little that I have learned and hope to continue learning, I am all for abolishing police. So first of all, defunding and then get ridding, uh, getting rid of them completely. But as a child of um, African descent, when I imagine a future where the police are not involved, the primary the first beneficiaries of that reimagined futures i do not see them being white i do not see you at the front of the line i don't um and that's something certainly that i um have to work through but it i don't know it feels kind of like a funny way for me for those that have benefited so long from this way of thinking are also the ones that will be the first in line to receive these new futures that weren't even imagined by them because they had been protected and looked after and coddled by um, state violence, essentially. Mm -hmm. okay. Just, no, just to add to Jamoke's point, um, yes, Angela Davis is someone to look up when you're looking at defunding the police. Ruth Wilson Gilmore also talks about the, um, the prison system itself as well and kind of working on stopping prisons being built and kind of reimagining what that could look like. So that's another good person to look up. And in terms of, um, if, you want to, if you want to learn anything about how white people came into prominence and all of this kind of stuff, I think it's just good to kind of look at history. Um, and there, there's a wealth- <laughs> Some uncomfortable <laughs> lessons might yes, be learned. There's a wealth of information uh, around, you know, and it, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be super, super complex. Someone in the um, talks wrote about Akala. You can read um, When We Ruled by Robin, um, I think his name's Robin Walker. There are lots of different um, historical kind of resources out there. And I think in order to understand the world as it is now, we have to look at what has led up to this point, right? So mm -hmm. pre-enslavement all the way through and what has built capitalism, what, um, what what we know now as white supremacy, how it started, what was commerce, what was culture, what was um, merchant exchange, you know, and looking at those things. And that's the only way you can really come to understand the system as we know it now. But don't be afraid to do the research. YouTube is free. Most of the time, like there are loads of little documentaries, you can watch loads of them. Some of them will have contrasting information, but that's important to look at a wide range of sources and also read books there are loads of you know someone's written the history of white people by nell irvin painter um there are lots of different books out there i would advise that you do look for books that are written by people of color about their histories about the way yes. in which they have viewed the world and the way they've experienced the world because often those histories um 
are written in a way that's slightly more comprehensive because they're not as a victor writing about their victories, right? Um, and they're not as a victor writing in order to sustain power. And so it's important that you kind of make sure that you go out of your way to look for people of colour who are experts in these fields and who you can And pay them from. when you're asking these questions. Don't ask for stuff for free. You will get cussed out. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <You're welcome. laughs> Thank you so much. And um, there's a link to the Triple Cripples website in the chat as well. So I encourage you all to check that out as well. Um, and are any of our other speakers, do you want to make any final concluding remarks before we wrap up? Can I? Can I? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, well, I would like to thank everybody, uh, Maya, Stephanie, Debbie, I, you know, I love your, your courage. You know, I was, I was marveled by what you were capable of saying about your experience and willing to engage on some sort of guilt trip. You know, own it up and say, this is what it is. And this is what we do not have. And I really appreciate the way you put those things on the table. Uh, of course, our young friends, Kim and Jumoke, uh, we will certainly learn something from your uh, contribution, which is extremely important and eye-opening. Alpha, uh, Alana, thank you very much. But I would like to say for Alpha uh, that there is one phrase you used and which is extremely important and people should remember that phrase, that reconstruction and emancipation was actually freedom to hunger. Because, you know, all those stage in African-American history were to contribute to, liber to liberating the black people. But if you are in a situation where as a farmer or a sharecropper, you don't have any farm to till, where are you going to have anything to eat? And if you don't have anything in your belly, where are you going to defend your rights? That's the whole tragedy of the African-American community being denied and deprived of what they need economically in order to survive. And I hear that in North Carolina, there is a city which is going to engage in reparation. And that reparation is something we should bear in mind because if you are denied economically, there is no way you can defend any rights. Look at the situation of third world countries. Finally, because I would not like to be long, sorry. Finally, I would say after Alpha, that Gore Island is going to change a little bit because we had a meeting with a municipality last Saturday and there is a particular place on Gore Island which used to be called Europe Square. It is going to be de-baptized and called the place of freedom and human dignity after George Floyd. And I think there is a big fresco of George Floyd, which is going to be painted there by a celebrated Senegalese artist. That will be one site or one feature of Gore Island, which will be offered to you when next you visit. And thank you for making me part of this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much um, for that, um, Professor Sen. Do, you, do you, either of you, um, Alana or Debbie, want to make any final comments? I would just say thank you so much. And I really have a, a special appreciation for the Triple Cripples for um, just being so straight on, so drama free, straight on, clear about the truth. And uh, you've, it's challenge. It's been uncomfortable and challenging for me. And I really appreciate that. I appreciate being here today. Thank you. I just want to reiterate my thanks uh, for the invitation, which ultimately um, I did write to Stephanie and we did have a short exchange about the panel. Um, personally, when I organize events, I don't speak at them. Uh, here in Australia, it's incredibly important to foreground the work of Aboriginal um, activists and scholars. And so when I personally organize events, um, they're the people who are foregrounded along with 
um, other racialized people, but mainly Aboriginal people, because we are living on settler, settled, sorry, colonized, um, settled land. Uh, and I think, you know, my advice as somebody who organizes a lot of events is to, to think about makeup of pounds. Also, the order of speaking, I was relatively surprised about. Um, nonetheless, I've learned a lot. Uh, but I think we all grow and learn from these experiences. And I think uh, Jamoka and Kim have raised incredibly important points that we can all take away with us and grow from. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you very much for that. And thank you, yeah, once again to all of our speakers for taking the time to um, contribute to what was a really important event. And the um, event will be shared as being recorded and the slides and the event will be shared afterwards. And I think we can share also any links that have been shared in the chat as well um, to all of the attendees. But yeah, thank you very much to all of you for taking the time. And I can see lots of people doing applause. Um, but yeah, thank you and uh, see you all, uh, see you all on a Zoom chat probably. Thank you. Before we all tune out, can I just do a big thanks to Maya and to Stephanie, because really this is a massive event by these two. They've taken it forward and it's, you know, I'm so proud of you guys for doing this. It's such a brilliant um, thing that you've managed to pull together. So I think all credit to them for taking it through their own steam and managing it, which they've done fantastically. So uh, big thanks to both of them from me and from the team, um, the festival team, and to all our speakers and all the participants. Thank you very much. Bye.